What's up, homies? Let me tell you, in the decade plus I have been fighting hair loss, I have tried dozens of products, including topical oils, natural supplements, experimental therapies, low-level laser light therapy, amongst others, and none of them have worked. I can understand the temptation people have in wanting to try new things to save their hair, but when time is of the essence, you may not be able to afford the trial and error that comes with unproven remedies, which is why I regret not having just started with finasteride uh, at the very beginning, rather than waiting to I was already a receded Norwood 3 hairline. Now, in my journey, I have found many products that don't work, but I've also found a few that have worked for me. Two of these treatments that have worked for me are minoxidil and stamoxidine. Now, minoxidil, if you're familiar with the history of the drug, it was actually the very first treatment um, FDA approved for uh, hair loss, but it was also the very first thing I used for male pattern baldness. And I have tried uh, many things before minoxidil, such as, uh, well, you know, uh, saw palmetto, uh, peppermint oil, some of the things that I mentioned before, uh, lasers, and none of those did squat. So I was pleasantly surprised that minoxidil worked very well for me. And like a lot of people, I got an initial shed with the drug, which stabilized after several months. And after about eight or 10 month period, I noticed a substantial amount of regrowth in the areas of the scalp where I still had hair. Now, keep in mind, I already had a very receded hairline, so I did not get any regrowth there because it was just slick bald, uh, which was unfortunate. And nothing I used subsequently helped me make up for any lost ground on the hairline, which is why I eventually got a hair transplant. So I wouldn't rely on pharmaceuticals to regrow a, a hairline. It's uh, very hard it's to happen. It's very rare to happen. I just wouldn't expect it. So if you do have a receded hairline, by all means, get on treatment, but expect fully that you may need to invest in something like a FUE or FUT hair transplant. So anyways, for the next two years, uh, roughly when I was using minoxidil, uh, I was using it as a standalone treatment and I didn't understand how it worked and I didn't really care and all that mattered to me was that it was working and it didn't give me side effects. So sadly, as time went on, I did in fact begin to lose ground again and I was noticing a degree of hair loss that wasn't as bad as things were pre-treatment where I was like, you know, clogging the shower drain every day, but things were noticeably getting consistently worse. And that is when I started finasteride, which initially made my hair loss worse again, you know, due to the shed. And I was really, really concerned. I was freaking out. So I talked to my doctor and he explained it like, to me this way. And that's that virtually any treatment for hair loss will possibly cause an initial shed due to the hair follicle going through an accelerated antigen, also known as a growth phase, which causes a premature shedding of the miniaturized hair follicles so that they will be replaced with thicker, stronger hair follicles. So I weathered the storm and after 10 months on continuous treatment, I finally noticed improvement. And that is why I always stress to people watching my videos to please do not panic over the shed. It's just a short-term price many of us have to pay uh, to have better hair in the long term. And fighting hair loss is a long-term battle after all. You know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And you should never expect to see significant benefits in the short term. You know, also another thing I want to mention is not everybody gets a shed. And not getting a shed is not a sign that the treatment is not working. Because, you know, it's funny. People, like, they freak out about a shed. But sometimes they freak out when they don't get a shed. I mean, it doesn't necessarily happen. But if it doesn't happen, that doesn't mean the drug's not working. I mean, consider yourself lucky if you don't get a shed. So getting back on subject, uh, the combination therapy of minoxidil and finasteride has always been what has maintained my hair over the past decade. And I have periodically experimented with, experimented with or added new things to my routine. And some of them have worked and some of them have not worked. But despite all the things that I've tried, the baseline stack has always been finasteride minoxidil. And that stack by far has contributed the most to my hair loss journey. Now, while in the short term, at least, I have used alternatives to finasteride, which have worked, like dutasteride, fluoridyl, uh, alpha tradiol mixed with ru 5 for one or CB0301 for my research subject, I have never been able to su successfully replace minoxidil. I mean, I've tried stopping it for periods of time, but, you know, I always get a shed after like four to six weeks. Now, finasteride is an anti-androgen. It's not a direct anti-androgen. It inhibits the 5A reductase enzyme, which in turn uh, uh, inhibits it's DHT. Um, but anyways, uh, since it does work to suppress the androgens on the scalp, albeit indirectly, replacing it with another anti-androgen will still give similar benefits. But minoxidil is a growth stimulant that works in a way that is not very well understood. But since it is not hormonal in any way, its mechanism of action is completely different from finasteride, and thus the two cannot replace each other, which is both a blessing and a curse. Now, it's a blessing in the sense that because being that they work differently, the two drugs can be stacked together to provide 
provide an effective combination therapy, which has been the gold standard for fighting hair loss since the 90s. But it's also a bad thing since once you start to get benefits with minoxidil, you cannot maintain them with finasteride and vice versa. Now, I have seen many attempts of people trying to drop minoxidil for finasteride, and every time the results are oh, are disastrous. You know, I've heard a few people say they successfully did it, but I question how well their results were on minoxidil to begin with, because, you know, some people don't get good results from minoxidil. And if you're not getting good results from minoxidil, then you won't see any dramatic losses if you stop it, because stopping minoxidil will only result in your hair looking the way it did before you started treatment. So minoxidil works for most people. It works really well. But even if you are considering minoxidil, I think it's important you start with finasteride first since finasteride is a better standalone treatment. And that's because it goes after the root cause of hair loss, which is DHT, dehydrotestosterone, on the scalp of individuals genetically predisposed to androgenic alopecia. And it's also easier to adhere to since it's just a pill rather than a topical solution, although you can make topical minoxidil more convenient to apply by converting the foam into a liquid. And I have a video tutorial on how to do that for those who are interested. So we know both minoxidil and finasteride work, but since minoxidil is an inconvenient treatment that cannot be replaced by anything, uh, people have looked um, into alternative growth stimulants they can add as adjuncts to finasteride as opposed to using minoxidil because a lot of people don't want to make that commitment. And there are many of them on the market, and most of them are just overpriced trash that barely work. And these would include things like Aminexil and Copexil. And these all suck because not only are they weaker than minoxidil, but but they are also derivatives of minoxidil. So all of the flaws that apply to uh, minoxidil will also apply to these minoxidil derivatives. And that would include, you know, having to stay on it for life. And so they're basically just like minoxidil, except they don't work as well. And oftentimes they're more expensive. So if you're going to use one of these type of treatments, you might as well just use minoxidil since it works better. It's cheaper. It's more widely available. So it's just, they're just terrible, these uh, minoxidil derivatives. But uh, another very rare problem with minoxidil I want to bring up though is that since minoxidil was originally developed as an anti-hypertensive medic medication called lonitin, some people, and this is very rare, but I do want to stress this, but some people have reported cardiovascular side effects due to systemic absorption, in which case you probably wouldn't want to continue using minoxidil under any circumstances, even if you are getting good uh, results from it. Uh, because, you know, it's a uh, Minoxidil as a anti-hypertensive medication is not designed for people with normal blood pressure. So if you're getting cardiovascular side effects from uh, minoxidil, even topical minoxidil, if it's absorbing systemically, this could cause an unsafe drop in blood pressure, which can cause many health problems, including sudden cardiac death. So no amount of uh, hair growth is worth dying over. So just keep that in mind. And you know, Again, this is a very, very rare side effect of uh, topical minoxidil. So I don't mean to fear monger since most people respond to minoxidil very well and with no issue. So nevertheless, there are people who don't want to try minoxidil for reasons which I have stated and for other potential reasons such as being allergic to the active ingredient or another ingredient found in the solution. So what about a growth stimulant that works differently from minoxidil? I mean, would it have the same drawbacks as minoxidil? Well, to answer that question, let's take a look at a lesser known but still fairly popular hair growth stimulant known as demoxidine. Now, stamoxidine is available commercially over the counter in the European Union, Union, although it can be purchased elsewhere online via sources like Amazon, on eBay, so you can acquire it if you live in the States or in Australia, and is sold as either Cerioxyl or Neogenic, although I don't believe the latter is available anymore. And it was uh, the, the way it worked, Neogenic, is that they were sold in like individual vials and you use like one daily. And I'm glad they got rid of that because it's just a bunch of plastic waste. But uh, anyways... Uh, there are com other commercial versions of stamoxidine that are available, but they are all the same, being that they are 5% stamoxidine and an ethanol-based solution. I've never heard of or seen like stamoxidine being sold in any solutions greater than the 5% con concentration or anything less than that for that matter. Now, being that minoxidil is an FDA-approved medication, it's going to have far more research backing up its efficacy than a treatment like stamoxidine, but stamoxidine still has some research behind it, which shows that it works in a very interesting way. Now, before I get into explaining how stamoxidine works, let's look at some of the clinical trials behind minoxidil so we can better understand the difference between it and stamoxidine. So, like I said, uh, the mechanism behind how minoxidil works is not fully understood, and this is the case for a lot of drugs, which is why outcome data is 
always more important than mechanistic data. Now, mechanistic data is still important since it can provide data for researching future treatments, but there are many drugs out there on the market that work without us fully understanding why or how. So outcome will always be higher on the information hierarchy than mechanistic data. Now, in the case of minoxidil, it is believed to prolong the antigen phase, which as I said, is the growth phase of the hair follicle. And this is why it works. And it's also why it likely causes a premature shed that so many people dread in many individuals since in, in an accelerated antigen phase, this causes the old, weaker hair follicles to fall out to make way for newer, stronger hairs. So that why, in the short term, paradoxically, these hair loss treatments can cause hair loss, but in the long term, it's worth it because you'll end up with uh, more and better hair mo more often than not. So there are numerous theories out there as to why uh, it, this works, including like, you know, dermal papilla cell proliferation, the opening of potassium channels, uh, prostaglandin synthesis, but none of these have been proven. And again, it's not as important as outcome. And even if we don't know exactly how minoxidil works, we know it does work and that it works extremely well by the standards of a growth stimulant. So, you know, the outcome is what's important. Now, in a meta-analysis of clinical trials on minoxidil, the average increase in hair count per square centimeter for 2% minoxidil was 8.11 hairs, while for 5% minoxidil, it was 14.9 hairs compared to placebo. So that means 5% minoxidil is roughly 40% better than 2%. To give you an idea of how much hair growth that gives you, let's look at the average scalp on an adult human being. The average adult will have anywhere from 100 to 140,000 hairs on, the, on their scalp. The surface area of a human scalp is roughly 650 square centimeters. So using math to calculate how much hair minoxidil gives you, 2% minoxidil will give you about 5,272 extra hairs on the scalp and 5% minoxidil will give you 9,685 hairs. So that is close to 10% of all the hairs on your scalp. Now, you know, minoxidil has a reputation for being the strongest hair growth stimulant on the market and for good reason. And despite its drawbacks, there's no denying that it works extremely well and that's why I like it. But how does it compare to stamoxidine? Well, like I said, stamoxidine is interesting because it works in a different way than minoxidil. People who have researched the growth cycle of a hair follicle will know that most growth stimulants influence primarily the antigen phase of the hair follicle, like minoxidil, and they do this by enhancing growth during the antigen phase, or they prolong the antigen phase. And what is interesting about stamoxidine, though, is that it has no influence on the antigen phase of the scalp whatsoever. So how does it work? Well, stamoxidine, what it does is that it shortens the lesser known kennel phase of the hair follicle. Now, to explain what that is, when hair enters its resting phase, uh, that's known as the telogen phase, what follows it is a brief period of inactivity known as the kinogen phase, where the hair follicle is basically doing nothing before it once again awakens and enters into the antigen phase. It's a period of inactivity, basically. Now, it's been shown that sufferers of androgenic alopecia will have a prolonged kinogen phase, and what stamoxidine does is shorten the kinogen phase so that the periods of inactivity on the hair follicle are shortened rather than directly lengthened the antigen period, which is what something like minoxidil would do. So stamoxidine is not an FDA approved drug, so we're not going to see any big meta-analysis of clinical studies. In fact, the sole study on stamoxidine was done by L'Oreal, which is the company which uh, that manufactures it, which doesn't sound very promising, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad study, but it does suggest potential corporate bias. But in the studies done on stamoxidine, it was shown that over a period of three months, subjects would experience a net hair growth of 4% hairs, which doesn't sound like all that much because it really isn't, especially when we consider that the average scalp can have up to 150,000 hair follicles in it. So compared to minoxidil, stamoxidine may not even grow as much hair as 2% minoxidil since the amount of hair grown uh, with stamoxidine would be anywhere from 4,000 to 6,000 hairs depending on the scalp density. However, since it doesn't affect the antigen phase, the hair follicle, it's possible stamoxidine may not cause that dreaded initial shed. And having used stamoxidine, I never got any initial shed unlike with finasteride and minoxidil where I both got pretty bad sheds. Also, being that these two growth stimulants work on the hair follicle in different ways, it suggests the two could have a synergistic effect. Speaking personally, I don't think anything has ever gotten me better hair growth results than using uh, minoxidil combined with stamoxidine, especially if I use it alongside uh, finasteride. Now, I will only use each of the two per day with stamoxidine being what I apply in the morning since it dries much more quickly than minoxidil. But for both, I will usually apply anywhere from three to six milliliters to get complete scalp coverage. 
and I massage it in really well with my knuckle or my finger. And with uh, stomoxidine, sometimes I'll mix it with alpha tradiol just because, you know, they have a similar texture and they dry similarly. Uh, minoxidil tends to be a little bit more viscous and it takes longer to dry. Now, Another lesser known benefit of stomoxidine, which I've covered before, is that it is a great, and I mean absolutely fantastic solvent for RU5841. Uh, and that's for my research subject, of course. And I will use no more than uh, 20 milligrams, as anything beyond that is overkill and gives my research specimen side effects. Uh, but with stomoxidine, I will use 20 milligrams of RU5841, and I will mix it with either a glass uh, vial or a shot glass and it dissolves in just like a period of seconds. Now minoxyl can also be used as a solvent but it doesn't dissolve as well especially at room temperatures. Now if you put minoxidil and RU uh, and you mix them together in the freezer for a few hours uh, that will help it, mi help it mix together a little bit better but even then I can't seem to get it to dissolve completely no matter how hard I shake it. So for my solvent of choice I will always use either stomoxidine or alpha tradiol sometimes together and alpha tradiol is also a good solvent and a pretty decent topical anti-androgen in its own right. So another question people have is if you will lose any ground if you stop using stomoxidine after having used it for a while and gotten some results with it. Now, I know people have said otherwise, but I think the answer is actually yes. The official recommendation for stomoxidine is to use it cyclically uh, because that is how it was done in studies, like once, I mean, over a co course of like three months and then you stop for a while. Uh, but I have noticed much better results from just using it like and staying it on it continuously and making it part of my daily routine routine, much like minoxidil. And if you're curious about my daily routine for hair loss, by the way, I do have a video on that as well. Now, I think the people, the reason why people say they didn't lose ground stopping it is because tamoxidine doesn't grow that much hair. So I think it's possible that these people didn't notice uh, that much hair loss because they didn't gain that much hair to begin with. And maybe they just didn't respond to treatment as well as the subjects in the study. So because of that, even though I very much like tamoxidine and I plan to use it indefinitely, I still think minoxidil is the overall winner in the battle of hair growth stimulants. It's more effective. It has far more research behind it that isn't skewed by industry bias. And it's cheaper since it's been off patent for many years now. Like I can buy like a three month supply for 20 US dollars from Target. I mean, it's not actually a three month supply in my case because I use so much of it though. That being said, stomoxidine is still a good treatment to stack with minoxidil, but I think unless you are a hair loss veteran, meaning you've been on treatment for over six years, then you don't really need to consider adding any more treatments to your stack. For newcomers, uh, just using finasteride will be enough, and even for a lot of veterans, finasteride may be all they ever need, especially since there are people out there who have been using finasteride alone since 1992, and it still works for them even as a standalone treatment. And I like minoxidil, and, it, and even though it does suck having to use minoxidil for the rest of your life, uh, that really is no different than any other treatment that we currently have on the market. You know, there's no cure for male pattern baldness, so anyone who wants to save their hair must be willing to commit to it long term. And you know, I know a lot of slap heads will say the commitment isn't worth it, but I'd much rather take a pill and just put a few drops of liquid on my scalp every day rather than take a damn razor to my head and shave my head in a futile attempt to hide that I'm obviously still balding, especially since I hate shaving my face enough as it is and I really can't stand the bald and bearded look. It just looks so damn cliche and unoriginal. It's like the men decide that since they can't grow hair on their head, they'll compensate by growing this nasty ass beard. And I don't mean to like uh, insult beard uh, beard wearers out there. I mean, there are some good looking beards, but to me, for most people, especially bald people, when you grow like a really beard, big beard, it looks like you're just trying to grow your hair upside down. And you know, I can't grow a beard to begin with, so it's not even an option for me. You know, it's funny. And I've seen some of those like bald acceptance videos where the bald guy will like look into the camera and talked about how he has a renewed sense of confidence from shaving his head and how it's the best decision he ever made. But if these slap heads were really so damn confident, why would they need to seek validation from so many people on Line. Why would there even need to be like a bald acceptance community to, be, to begin with? And you know, when I look deeply into their eyes, I can really see their pain because you know, I've been there. And while I can't blame them for trying to find some solace in their misery, I can say for sure, I would never want to join in their sorrow. So any minor inconvenience taking pharmaceuticals causes me, uh, that pales in comparison to the soul crushing misery I'd feel being a slaphead. So, you know, they always talk about like, they always name drop these few celebrities, but uh, who look good when they're bald but you know for every bald guy who looks like Jason Statham or The Rock there are going to be a thousand others who look like Jason Blaha well maybe not quite that bad but definitely not good
So even if there are a few outliers, being bald looks bad on just about everybody. And that's why, you know, there's such a huge interest in, in fighting hair loss. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. So to conclude, I think stamoxidine is a good choice for people who either can't or don't want to use minoxidil or for those who currently use minoxidil but aren't getting great results. But for those who are looking for stronger growth, the stronger growth stimulant, minoxidil is still the best thing we have in the market. So that combined with its wide availability, its affordability, makes it the clear first choice for those fighting the good fight. Anyways, thanks for watching guys and I'll be back with more content soon. So until then, take care.